future is mushrooms. And if football doesn't work out, you know, I'll hire you at Michael Love Farms. <laughs> <laughs> Power to the shroom. Perfect. Hey everybody, Trey Wingo here. Welcome into another episode of Half Forgotten History. This week's guest is pretty cool because his nickname when he played was pretty cool. I'm not sure when he played there was a better nickname than Jake the Snake Plumber. Went to school at Arizona State, drafted by the Cardinals, and really turned that franchise around and had the most defining win in 30 years for that team before, of course, they went on to Super Bowl 43 under Kurt Warner. But what Jake Plummer did is not as interesting as what he's doing now and how he got there. That story may surprise you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Half Forgotten History with Jake the Snake Plumber. All right, so Jake, as I was sort of prepping for this, I, fa- I ran across this quote from your former agent, Lee Steinberg, and I wanted to read it to you. Uh, Lee Steinberg said about you, he's, quote, one of the minuscule few that I could see living completely fulfilled life away from sports. He was as close to an egoless major star as I've ever seen. Is that accurate? <laughs> I don't doubt Lee Steinberg, man. That guy's a uh, visionary. So, you know, when he said that about me, he must have known something and... Uh... Yeah, you know, Lee, Lee, what a great guy. I mean, as a youngster coming out of college, having that guy pursuing me as a, as his, as a client of his was a, a huge confidence boost. And he helped me through some early troubles in my career and really, uh, you know, guided me in a lot of good ways. But, yeah, I guess, I mean, everyone has ego, right? So it's how you yeah. control that ego. And, and getting away from the game is definitely – there's a lot that comes to play with your ego. And as time has gone, I've uh, – yeah, I enjoy the game. I love the game. It was good to me. Um, the game is going to always be part of my life, but I uh, am pursuing other things and enjoying life and what it brings me right now. Well, that that's part of why I think this is going to be such a great episode, because I love stories that take unexpected turns, and we'll get into all that stuff in, in a minute. But I also had I found this quote, too. When you were doing Meals on Wheels, one of the people that you were driving for was – shocked to find out that you were a former NFL player. She had no idea that that was what you were doing before you started doing a lot of volunteer work. Yeah. I mean, right when I retired, you know, I, when I got done playing, it was uh, a lot, there was a lot of heavy pressure here in Denver. I mean, everybody expected yeah. really to be, for me to be John Elway his last two years here, which yeah. I mean, John won two Super Bowls. How do, how do you duplicate that? So it was a tough. It was tough to live up to those expectations, and out in society, um, I'll be honest. I had uh, social anxiety. I, I would go anywhere I went. I would just try not to look people in the eyes because as soon as they got eye contact, it was like, "Hey, Jake!" And then my whatever I was doing yeah. was now everyone else's life was included in that. So I didn't mind that. I remained kind and tried to spend time to give to people. But when I when I was you know getting out of the game, I just wanted to be kind of anonymous. I just wanted to be a person coming to help do meals on wheels to deliver for a good, to, to give my time to a good deed and help the seniors at the Sandpoint senior center. And, uh, yeah, the lady working there, she was shocked that she, I said, is there anything I can do? And she said, well, yeah, there's all these needles and, and stuff that needs raked out in the yard. So I went out and raked them all up, put them away. When I came back in, she was just like, she was like felt horrible, horrible about putting me out there because I was Jake Plummer, the former quarterback. I'm like, no, don't worry, man. That's okay. Like, don't yeah. treat me different just because of that. Like, I liked raking the leaves. That was fun. I didn't mind that at all. But she felt horrible, like I should be doing something bigger. And for me, that's really what it was about. It's like I just wanted to be able to play my career and then be able to assimilate back into society. Yeah, and have an impact on people. I'll always be able to kind of do that just from my, my past. But but to not be a standout anymore, to not be the focus of everyone's attention. Because when you're playing quarterback, you know, all eyes are on you. And what, you know, you're really number two in the, in the structure of, a, of an organization. It's the owner and then the quarterback and then the head coach. And people don't think that's true, but head coaches get fired and, and quarterbacks stay. So it is true. You know, you're the number two man on a, on a billion-dollar organization. So it's a really heavy, a heavy position to be in. And, uh, you know, you have to take it and own it. And then, you know, when I was done, I wanted it to kind of go away. <laughs> yeah. And I, I do love that you found so many fun and interesting things to do post-career. We're getting to all of that because I find it fascinating. But, but let's start with when most people knew you. And that's when you sort of burst onto the scene at Arizona State. You didn't want to go to Arizona State, though, right? You initially wanted to go to Stanford. Yeah, Stanford was my top choice. Just, uh, you know, the education and the school and, and uh, you know, Bill Walsh was there. 
Terry Shea. I'd gone to their camp the summer before my senior year and uh, made an impression on them. And that really was what, what got me recruited across the country was I set a foot speed record at the camp that still stands. And so that put me on the map as like, yeah, this little kid from Idaho, you know, he may have some abilities here at this next level. But they took Scott Frost. Scott Frost signed, and they told me we got our quarterback, so, you know, you're free to go wherever you want. And it came down to Washington State and Arizona State, and Washington State was real close to where my dad lived in North Idaho. And, and right across the border in Idaho was the University of Idaho in Moscow, where half of the Capitol High School graduating class went to school. So I'm thinking, if I go to Wazoo, I'm basically just going to be going – and being like right into the party scene with all my high school buddies and, and people that I would yeah. know. So I kind of wanted to do something different. And, and I wanted to leave an impression where I, wherever I went. You know, ASU, I'd never heard anything about. Uh, they weren't a perennial powerhouse. I wanted to go there. And when I left, you know, have them be on the map and do something special. And Bruce Snyder's the reason I went. He said we could win a national title or your key, key component to us having a chance to win a national title. And uh, when he said that, that was that boost of confidence that I needed as an 18-year-old out of Boise, Idaho. And went down there, had a couple tough years, but that senior year was, was magical. He, he was right. He put all the pieces together to, to, the, to culminate in what was a, a really special team. Yeah, and, and you started right away. Like, there was no red shirt for you. you. I think you missed, what, two games your freshman year? And, and you, you really jumped into the mix from the get-go. Yeah. About halfway through the year, I got a chance to take over the reins. I was the backup, and the starter was, was not performing and really wasn't the leader that Bruce needed for that team. And so I got in there, and, yeah, I got in. And against Washington State, actually, was my first, my second live action because the week before I sprained my ankle at Oregon State. Uh, but I went in against Wazoo, the number one defense in the country, and, and we, we scored 21 points on them in the second half. And I threw a couple interceptions, got rocked a few times, but it was that night, now I was you know, playing Pac-10 ball, and it was no looking back after that. So when did Jake the Snake become a thing? Because I, you know, it's funny, if I say Jake Plummer, I feel like I'm not really calling you by your name. You know what I mean? Everybody, every, when you were playing, everyone knew you as Jake the Snake yeah. Plummer. When did that sort of stick? Well, I, my my real name is not Jake. You know, I was birth name yeah. is Jason. So uh, when I got into the third grade at transferred schools, there were four other Jasons in the classroom. And the teacher was just like, please tell me you have a nickname or something. I said, I'll go by Jake. <laughs> so that started the whole J going by Jake in the third grade. And then in the seventh grade, I read Kenny Stabler's book. Uh, my brother said, hey, you should read this book. It's really good. And so I read that book. And he was the original snake, you know, Kenny Stabler. And so... Uh, I kind of took on that nickname. My brothers called me the Snake and their friends. And then I got to a basketball camp with Chris Childs, who played at Boise State, and Arnell Jones and all the Boise State basketball players. It was a basketball camp. And they started calling me the Snake in, like, seventh, eighth grade. And so my friends started calling me the Snake. And then I'd start, you know, if I had to sign an autograph, I'd practice, you know, my autographs. I knew how to do that by all the Sports Illustrated posters I had on my wall you know, copying Walter Payton's autograph and Marcus Allen and all these guys. So I knew what my autograph looked like. And when I signed it, I'd put the snake down. And freshman year at ASU at Fan Photo Day, I, I started signing Jake the snake with every – I put the snake with everything. I put all the number sign and all that in there and didn't realize that that would become something I would do a lot of. Um, so I streamlined my autograph. But the snake is definitely something that stuck. And, uh, you know, thankfully I had – snake-like abilities on the field to escape and not get caught and you know it was a pretty appropriate nickname and definitely no negative connotations there uh, when snake can be th thought of as a as negative connotation but you know learning about snakes and how they shed their skin and transform and always uh, are, are you know tr you know becoming something new every year they shed their skin to like be fresh and new again it definitely is appropriate now even post-career Plus, they're slippery as hell, and you were slippery as hell as a quarterback. I mean, you were yeah. you didn't have Michael Vick speed or Kyler Murray speed, but you were hard to bring down. Yeah, that's my, that was just, you know, through years and years of playing recess tackle football, or we call the tackle 500, where we just have one ball and someone would throw it, and 10 kids would be trying to tackle you with the ball. I mean, I learned how to escape, yeah. you know, and get out of, out of tricky situations, and uh yeah, thankfully, I would, like I said, thankfully my nickname was appropriate as I did have some ability to make guys miss and hard to catch a snake, so sometimes it was tough to catch me. <laughs> so the Cardinals caught you in the second round of the draft. What was your what were your expectations? Because the draft now is like, it's a whole shit show. Look, I did it for years. I understand it. It's great. It's a circus. You know, it's a whole thing. It's a reality television show. 
it was just sort of a football thing back in the 90s. So what were your expectations going into the draft about where you might go? I didn't really have many expectations other than I, I really, you know, I had some teams that I thought would be interested and would be fun to play for. Um, you know, Sam Fran being one of those as, you know, Bill Walsh had had coached, had coached me at the camp there in uh, Stanford before my senior year in high school and then going through college and like I knew that I was on their radar. Um, but at that moment, Sam Fran was trying to part ways with Bill Walsh, like not go in the direction, yeah. kind of kind of get a, a little bit separated from him and his influence. And at the time, you know, they, they drafted Jim Druckenmiller with the first pick, which oh, he checked all the boxes, you know. He checked all yeah. the boxes. Big, saw, big 6'4", 220, prototypical drop-back pocket passer. And I was only 6'2", 195 pounds and, you know, wasn't uh, supposed to be – you know, able to take the beating the the NFL was going to put on me. Even though I played 43 straight college games, they still doubted my my ability to stay on the field. Uh, but that whole thing, like I said, it's a shit show. It's really, it really for me, it was like, what am I doing here? I went out and threw every ball I could at the, at the combine. I didn't care if I threw an incompletion or anything. I'm like, if you're judging me and drafting me because I threw a good spiral in Indianapolis on this shitty turf in in a high pressure <laughs> situation. You know, yeah. that you're not going and watching film and talking to my coaches and talking to my players and talking to the administration and understanding what kind of human being I am, number one, and then what kind of leader I am. And then, you know, put me on the field and give me the right game plan, the right people around me, and then, you know, good things can happen. So I took the draft as really something fun to be involved with. I was just like, man, I'm, yeah. I'm here at the draft. Are you kidding me? I'm going to be drafted in the NFL. This is my childhood dream coming true. So I really didn't care who was, who drafted me. I also would love to play for the Chiefs, but they traded uh, in the offseason. They got Elvis Gerback, and then they drafted Tony Gonzalez, so they made a good move there. Uh, but getting into the Cardinals was at first a little bit like, damn, I really would like to have gone somewhere else because I'd been well, in that, Arizona. That's what I wanted to ask you. Like, Were you happy that it was the place you played college ball? Or were you thinking, I really would like to experience something new here? I wanted to experience something new. I wanted to go somewhere, you know, a bigger city, a different city, and, and, you know, feel what that would be like to even go play for the New York Jets or Giants, like to see what it would be like to be under that kind of, like, in Careful. that kind of a city. I don't know anybody that really wants to play for the Jets. I mean, let's just, you know, they, they, let, no offense to Jets fans, but it's been a terrible 40 years been, since, Super, yeah, since Joe Namath, whatever. Run. Well, you yeah. know, that that's never been my MO to go not to shy away from something like that. Like got, yeah. when I got drafted to the Cardinals, even though I had I had hopes of going somewhere new, uh, I was actually really pleased cuz it was an easy transition. I didn't have to move. I didn't have to relocate and find contacts of everybody that I could lean on and trust. I had a, a great support staff still at ASU. I had all like teammates that I was still friends with. I had you know, friends there that I'd become friends with through college. So it was a really easy transition. And then, you know, reading the history of the Cardinals, I'm like, damn, these guys haven't won forever. Here's my yeah. chance to come in here now and, like, let's let's do something special. Why can't we win here? Let me let me hopefully be a little bit of the, you know, the catalyst behind this to, to get some winning going on here and change the culture of, of a team that really – was on their way out of Arizona. They were pretty much going to be relocated to, to L.A. if not for that 98 season when we, you know, miraculously won all those last-second games at the end of the year and made it to the playoffs and beat the Cowboys. I mean, I didn't win a Super Bowl, but the equivalent of one was was accomplished that year in Arizona in 98 with the way we came out, winning, beating the Cowboys on the road. Um, it kind of solidified that team in the Valley finally as, as somebody the fans could root for. Yeah, listen, you're 100% right, and one of the reasons I do this is people, like, forget things that were monumental at the time, and I like to remind them of how things were. Like, before Kurt Warner, you know, took the Cardinals to Super Bowl forty three and had a really good run there, it was Jim Hart and then you. Uh, that was sort of the, the stellar quarterbacks, and Jim played when they were the St. Louis Cardinals in the early 70s. So, I mean, Arizona football was bad for a long time, and... and Let's not gloss over that win over the Cowboys. They, they beat you. They thumped you guys twice in the regular season. I think they beat you 38-10 to start the week, to start the season week one. And then it was a pretty close game, 35-28, uh, where you guys played them the second time. But you guys went into Texas Stadium when they were still the Dallas Cowboys of the 90s. Yeah. That was their first ever home playoff loss with Emmett and Irvin and Aikman and, and all those guys. 
And you guys went up there, and you almost shut them out. I mean, you took a 20 nothing lead late in the game, and they finally scored like a you, – you gave them a courtesy touchdown uh, at the end of the game. How significant was that for Arizona to finally embrace the Cardinals? Yeah, like I said, I mean, it was really a chance. We, we were stumping uh, for the elections that year to get the vote passed for the stadium that's now there. And, uh, you know, had we been losing and, and we weren't an exciting team, you know, that vote might not have passed. But we were the cardiac cards. If you remember the end of that season, we won four games. All of them come from behind victories. Even on, you know, December 19th is my birthday, and we played the Saints on December 21st. And on the Friday night of my birthday is when I renegotiated my rookie contract and signed that huge multi-million dollar contract right towards the end of the season. And I'm like, damn, we still got to make the playoffs. You know, this was there was intense pressure there, but we had such a fun team. We had such a great, a great group of guys, some real foundational players like Larry Sinners, Jameer Miller, Lomas Brown. I mean, we had we had some solid, solid guys. And that that victory, you know, it doesn't get much doesn't get talked about a whole lot, um, but I believe that, and I truly believe that if we hadn't had that season, that there would be no team in Arizona right now. So the significance of that season was really why there's still a team in Arizona. And may, people may think I'm crazy, but you know the, that, that town was not buying in to the Cardinals. No. And L.A. was crying for a team, and I know that it was about to happen. So that was a real significant season, and, and you know something like I said, the 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 how big that victory in that season was, was not a Super Bowl win, but it was equivalent because it, it really kept that team in the Valley. And now look at them. They made it to the Super Bowl. They've changed the culture there. They're doing some good things. they got a stadium now that they can call their own. And even though that pissed me off when they talk shit about Sun Devil Stadium, I'm like, don't talk about that stadium. That's the best grass yeah. in the country, man. That's the best, smoothest, <laughs> best playing service you can find. But it was hot as hell on those Sunday days, day games yeah. for sure. Yeah, I, I went to a Super Bowl at that stadium, Super Bowl 30. Trust me, the new place is nicer. Uh, the giant toaster is just nicer. I mean, you might be right about the yeah. grass, but it is a it is a much better facility. There's no question about it. Yeah. Table, why don't we take our why don't we take our first break here? We come back with Jake the Snake Plumber. We'll talk about the second part of his career in Denver and then what he's been doing after that. You're watching Half Forgotten History with Jake Plumber. All right, time for our Mercedes-Benz trivia question for this episode. And Jake Plummer, of course, started in Arizona, finished his career with the Denver Broncos. He's tied for fifth all-time on the Broncos list with most interceptions thrown with 53. The question is, do you know who he's tied with on that Denver list? Stick around. We'll give the answer after the break. You know, you open up a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter and you're opening more than doors. You're unlocking potential to do your own thing, be your own boss, and live out your own dreams. With 16 body types, your choice of a gas or diesel engine, and thousands of ways to customize, a Sprinter van is capable and versatile enough to help you drive your ambitions as far as you want to take them. So go ahead, unlock your potential inside a Mercedes-Benz Sprinter. All right, as promised, here's the answer to the Mercedes-Benz trivia question. We told you that Jake Plummer's tied for the fifth most interceptions thrown in Denver Broncos history with 53. The quarterback that he's tied with, Peyton Manning. So Jake Plummer can say, I've done something that Peyton Manning has also done. And now let's enjoy the rest of this Half Forgotten History episode with the quarterback termed mushroom farmer, Jake Plummer. All right, so back with Jake Plummer here on Half Forgotten History. So as you said, you, you had the defining win of a franchise. That was their first playoff win since they won the entire NFL title in 1947 as the Chicago Cardinals. I mean, it had been a long time. So you had to think, hey, man, I'm going to be a star in Arizona for the Cardinals forever. And then it wasn't much long after that that they decided to move on. Was that a surprise to you? Um. You know, not at all, because if, if you look back after 98, and I mentioned the players that we had on that team, we let them all go. We let Larry Sinners go, Lomas Brown, Jameer Miller, and a few others that were very instrumental in, in what we did in 98. And that was, you know, thinking back, uh, I can sit across, I can visualize sitting across from Bob Ferguson, our GM, when he told me, hey, we're going to let Larry Sinners go, but don't worry, we're drafting this fullback out of Nebraska, and you, you guys will be all right. I should have stood up maybe slammed the chair on the on the desk to emphasize that this was the worst move in history and left the room and never showed up for a while until they could 
bring Larry back because Larry Sinners was was such a core component to our team. I'm, I don't know if you he know was Larry. Incredible. Yeah, he was incredible. Yeah, he was he was he was the leader, the unquestioned leader on that team, and we just said goodbye to him. But also, he was my dude. He rallied hard for me to get drafted by the Cardinals, and when I got there, he took me under his wing. And so, they just. You know, they did some things that made it really tough. I injured my thumb in the preseason that next year, but I tried to play through it. I had my worst year of my career through 27 picks. I couldn't get the velocity on the ball. It was a horrible season. And then we just struggled. You know, we had a few years there where we just struggled. We couldn't quite put it together. We didn't draft well. We drafted, you know, pretty pretty objects instead of drafting what we, what we needed. And, you know, no offense to Thomas Jones, great running back, but we had Michael Pittman and, that was a year Brian Urlacher was in the draft, and we didn't draft a right. linebacker, and we needed a better defense. It was obvious. We needed a guy like him on defense to go with Ronnie Mack and all the guys, Kwame Lasseter, the guys we had, but we drafted another running back. And, like, you know, there was just some bad moves made, and, and uh, we had four, you know, a few years, four years after that that we did not perform well. So when the time came for me to be a free agent, I was ready. I was ready to go somewhere else because I saw where – you know, other guys that are gone, going to other teams were, were in the playoffs and playing in Super Bowls. And I'm like, yo, I don't see that drive here. I don't see that, that push to make that happen. So I'm going to go somewhere else. And my options that year when I was a free agent were Chicago and Denver. And, uh, you know, what, what two great teams to go to, two great teams with a lot yeah. of tradition and winning tradition. And, uh, you know, those options for me were exciting, especially to go play for Mike Shanahan and, and play in a, in a town like Denver. It was a pretty awesome opportunity. You know, and, and the, I guess the highlight of your time in Denver was hosting the AFC Championship game, uh, the year that uh, Pittsburgh sort of had, went on that magical run, which was Jerome Bettis's you know, final year, and the Super Bowl was in Detroit, and they got there, and they took care of the Seahawks. But you had to think, hey, man, this is it, right? Uh, we got the AFC title game in our place. We are good to go. Yeah, that's a that was really tough losing that game just because, you know, all the work we put in the two years prior, making the playoffs, um, getting beat, understanding where our weaknesses were, addressing those weaknesses. And like you know, that organization was was top notch. Mr. Bolin was all about the players, whatever we needed, I mean whatever we needed. <laughs> you know, hey, we need a night off. All right, you got the night off. I mean, he was all about us making sure we we came to work refreshed and ready to play. And, uh, you know, that, that, that loss at, at home was really tough um, because that was our chance yeah. to, to go and win a Super Bowl. That was my chance to, to fulfill a childhood dream. A lot of people don't know, but I was ready to retire right after that on the stage with the really? MVP trophy in my hand. I was ready to say thank you, goodbye. I came for a Super Bowl ring. I got it. I'm done playing football because it was just a lot. It was a lot on my body, a lot on my mind. Um, spiritually, it was just it was tough playing in that high level intensity where you know Shanahan a, a phenomenal coach I mean a brilliant coach look at his tree from Washington right now that's oh spread God, all yeah. across the NFL I mean the guy is a genius but almost a mad genius to the degree of like for me you know hey if you call the play and it doesn't work that's okay that's what I do I make a bad play work or I might throw a pick you know that was just my style yeah. and he did not like that we didn't mesh towards the ends of my career my 10th season or my 10th season was pretty tough because you know, he, I lost Kubiak, moved on to Houston, uh, had a new uh, offensive coordinator, and, and Mike, you know, you know, really didn't let me do what I, what I was good at doing and what Kubiak was able to get me into those situations uh, play-calling-wise. But Mike just wanted perfection. He wanted someone like Peyton Manning that could go out there and, and, and internalize and then digest and then change the call during a 25-second play clock and, that clock. and that wasn't me. That was not my style. So we kind of butted heads there my 10th year. You know, ended up getting benched, um, but that was a blessing in disguise. You know, I ended up really enjoying those last five games, going to the stadium, relaxed, not feeling the pressure of having to get out there and, and be perfect for him and for the team yeah. and for the for the organization. And uh, I was able to kind of drift out, and then that was when I decided, you know, it's time to retire. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to move on. It's been 10 years. I always thought 10 would be a great length for a season, and I still can't even believe I played 10 seasons. It was, uh, you know, those – few there in Arizona that were tough when we went three and 13 and got our asses kicked but going to the Broncos was uh was really a blessing to play for that organization to play for Mr. Bolin and play for an organization that their main impetus was winning no matter what and they did whatever they could take whatever they could do to make sure we had the, the the tools to do that and that was a fun experience 
did they trade you to the Bucks, or they were going to trade you to the Bucks? I, I can't remember what happened there. Yeah. I retired, talked to Mike yeah. on the phone, told him my plans, and he said, yeah, I don't believe you, and hung up and <laughs> traded my rights to Tampa Bay. Yeah. Now, come to find out, you know, this is a money business, right? The NFL is all about money. So I was due a, a, a bonus from the Broncos, a $3.5 million bonus, Mr. Bowen was not going to do anything about it. It was just going to be there and be my money. Well, when I got traded to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, that that got transferred to them. So, in the long run, they knew that it was a, high, a good gamble. They could either they would either get me as a quarterback, which they wanted and Gruden wanted. Right. But if I didn't choose to play, they would get that three and a half million dollars into their account to use uh, on their cap. So. It was a, it was a, it was twofold. Good move for the Buccaneers, and you know, for me, I was just, I was done. I didn't want to play anymore. I had a small aspiration to try to go play for Gary and in, in Houston because they had a hell of a team, and all they needed was a, was a quarterback that could lead that team. And I knew that there was a chance to win a Super Bowl there, but then that that wasn't going to happen because my rights were traded. But I retired, and I guess you can still trade retired players' rights, even though they've retired to other teams in case yeah. they decide to come back. And that's just what Mike did. He got a, he got a six-round draft pick out of it, and the Tampa Bay Bucks got $3.5 million. So I was good. I well, was done. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. First of all, I love the fact that, like, you walking away was, like, the, the, the craziest thing in the world. How can he walk away from five potentially yeah. $5 million? Like, people could not wrap their heads around it now. I think, I think they can now. But I read this great story about – uh, Gruden and, and then Bruce Allen, who was in the front office of the Bucks, went up to Idaho to try and recruit you, right? They were, they were, yeah. they were selling you, right? Come on, we're going to do this. We, you met him at a bar somewhere. And uh, I, I read, I was thinking of the Sports Illustrated article where they were they thought they had you and you saw them do a little fist bump under the table and you're like, no, bro, I, I, I'm not coming back. No, they were, they were throwing all the angles they could at me. And, uh, you know, I just was done. I was mentally done. Physically, I was, I felt beat up. I just felt older. My body just felt torn apart. Um, I put myself through, you know, 10 seasons. I didn't miss a lot of games. In fact, I took every single offensive snap. I think four seasons out of my 10, I took every single offensive snap. Like no one else came in. So, uh, you know, those are, those were, you know, good years, but they took a toll on me. And at 10, I was ready to go. And mentally, I made my mind up. And I, I remember as a youngster seeing guys that could never, They'd retire, then come back, then retire and come back. I always thought, you know, make your mind up. Either if you're going to do it, stay and be there. But if you're not, then then get out and move on. And I had a lot of stuff I wanted to do. I wanted to travel. I was getting married that off season, uh, in love, ready to start, you know, a family and and travel the travel around and see my family and be a part of my family. Which you know they got to come down and see me, but I didn't get to see them during the during the season. You know, they they'd get a party after on Friday nights, Saturday nights, and after the games, we'd have a little bit of fun, but then I'd have to go back into the facility. And so I missed my family and I missed my friends. And so there was a lot of motivation to retire. And I don't look back at it at all, except I was happy to, to move forward. Well, listen, you clearly made the decision at the right time for you. But as we all know, if you grow up just wanting to be a football player, you're going to have a lot of problems because football, I mean, you lasted 10, most people don't last three and a half. So yeah. why don't we take our second break here, come back, we'll talk about the evolution of Jake Plummer and the things that he did in his post-career that I find fascinating. Coming right back on I Forgotten History. What's up, everybody? Welcome into a week two edition of Trey's Trends, presented by Caesar Sportsbook. You've heard the phrase, the NFL stands for not for long. It makes sense when you look at what happened week one. The Super Bowl champion Rams and the top seeds from last year's conferences, the AFC and the NFC, the Titans and the Packers, all lost in week one. One of those teams, the Titans, uh, will try to travel to Buffalo and even up their record as they take on the Bills on Monday night. Uh, the Bills that are currently the odds-on favorite to win the Super Bowl at Caesar Sportsbook at plus 525. And the Bills are 10-point favorites despite losing to Tennessee last year. But that's not a surprise for a Mike Vrabel team. Under Vrabel, the Titans are an NFL best 6-2 and two straight up when getting six or more points, covering all but one of those games. Find more of Trace Trends by following Caesar Sportsbook at Caesar Sports on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All right, back with Jake Plummer here on Half Forgotten History. So you retired after 10 seasons, still at the, you know, some would say at the pinnacle of your game. You know, you, you, you played really well towards the end, but you walked away, and then you tried to experiment on a bunch of different things. You started 
to do some hand uh, competitive handball with your brother, right? Yeah. <laughs> that was a game I played through my whole life. Growing up, uh, off seasons, I would go play in tournaments, come back in, in such great shape that football training was easy after that. My cardio was insane. So handball, you know, is it, a great sport. Uh, kids out there that are focusing on one sport, you should look into handball because it, it uses both sides of your body, you're sp yeah. spatially aware, lateral movement, mental toughness. So, yeah, I was really excited to get into a new phase, and, and, and handball was one of those, to be able to go tour around the United States playing tournaments. I wasn't a, a pro at all, but I got to step in the court with some of the best players in the world, and that was super fun, and it was a great, great for the game of handball and pretty obscure sport that – you know, doesn't get much pub, and most of the handball courts around the country are turned into Pilates studios now. So, you know, <laughs> to give that game some credence and to, to turn some kids onto that game and, and let people know there's a, another court sport that's fun and competitive was good. And then to get to be with my brother, you know, and traveling around playing doubles, it was great. Um, and the camaraderie in, in handball was really good. It helped me kind of transition out of the game into having some buddies to drink a beer with, hang out, shoot the shit, and play some handball. Well, I think that's the thing a lot of the guys uh, miss when they play. Like, for example, you know, for all those years I did NFL Live, all the players were like, yeah, we don't miss the playing as much as we miss hanging out with the dudes in the huddle and, you know, you know, cracking jokes and giving everybody shit and all that kind of stuff. So it was almost like a, a, a bridge, right, to give you a little bit of the hit you needed just to wean you off into the next thing. Yeah, it, I did that. I did some high school coaching too, which was a lot of fun. I got to see – you know, the little kid that wasn't going to play, have his chin strap buckled the whole game. And, and I saw the game at a different level that, that's high school football in Sandpoint, Idaho, where these kids aren't going on to play big, big league ball. They're playing ball for the love of the game. So it really got me back to, like, the true roots of football and what it meant for me was it's a great sport and it's a lot of fun and it's not all about money and pursuing Super Bowls and cutting good players. I mean, it, was, it, it got me back, you know, being a coach to, to really enjoy the little finer points of football and the beauty of it. And, and then you sort of were an early advocate for, for cannabis use, which now is so widely accepted. It was so controversial, you know, just 10 years ago. I did a, an episode with Ricky Williams, and obviously uh, that's what his life is right now uh, with his company. Um, what, what steered you in that direction? What made you think this is something that was important? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd moved back to Colorado and had hip surgeries uh, to, you know, not to replace them, but to, to fix them up so that I don't have to get them replaced. And I was going through some pretty tough times. And, uh, you know, a lot of players were coming down with CTE. Junior Seau had took, taken his life. And, you know, I was having deep, heavy thoughts of like, holy shit, like, where's my life going after my career here? What's what's next? And in in the door walks, not THC and marijuana, but CBD and hemp. A friend of yeah. mine, Nate Jackson, a teammate in, in, in oh, Denver Nate, here. Yeah. yeah, Nate's amazing. He he was in with a friend of ours, Ryan Kingsbury, who worked with Charlotte's Web. And they wanted to start a campaign on when the bright lights fade. Like, what happens to these big football stars when the lights go out? Where do they go? A lot of them suffer. A lot of them have, you know, so a lot of them end their lives or are, find themselves bankrupt, divorce you know, in bad situations. And why is that? So we, we started this campaign and it was really ultimately to help the mothers of these children that were getting no support from our government for giving these, their children who had Dravet syndrome or serious seizures, the medicine, the CBD, the, the hemp oil, and it was helping these kids, yet they were still breaking the law. So we were trying to bring light to that and differentiate between marijuana and THC and CBD and hemp, which there's a huge difference. You don't get right. high when you take hemp you don't you don't feel any psychotropic effects but it helps with inflammation it helps with anxiety it helps with sleep it crosses the blood brain barrier it helps re it's a neuroregenerator i mean there was a, all these things it's like this is obvious why is the nfl not actually giving the players this every single day they didn't want to hear about it you know i took it right to jeff miller took it to d maurice smith they were turned they turned their back to it because you know the NFL doesn't lead and lead the charge in these things. If they did that, they'd lose half their fans because maybe half the fans were against THC and marijuana and CBD. But now they've opened up the book a little bit. They know the players are using it and they're benefiting from it. So that really gave me a, my first foray into health and wellness and, and what, what power former athletes have of influence to like, hey, we tried this. It worked for me. Here's something that you may want to try. I'm not forcing you to try this, but think about it. If right. your health is not good, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, check check out CBD, check out Charlotte's Web, see what it can do for you. And 
there were some pretty profound moments where people wrote me emails or I saw them later on cross paths with them and they'd had life changing moments with just using CBD and it allowed them some more freedom of movement and got them back on their feet to live life because life's too short to be in pain and just taking what your doctor wants to give you and, you know, spiraling down that, that, <laughs> that non-health uh, yeah. avenue that we, uh, really Western medicine perpetuates. So I've been gifted with that ability and now, you know, a chance to, to go into a whole nother realm with, with yeah. fungi. Uh, you know, it's a yeah, whole yeah. other opportunity. Yeah. Now tell us about this because you are now an avid mushroom farmer, right? That's what you do. <laughs> and you grow these, these fungi for very specific reasons. I, I saw the headline. I'm like, I got to know about this. So tell me about this. <laughs> Yeah, I just laugh because, you know, I'm like, how did this happen? You know, a buddy of mine, Dale Jolly, my best friend out here in Colorado, he worked for Charlotte's Web. So we knew each other through what we did with, with hemp and CBD. And so right before the pandemic, he introduces me to Rashad Evans, Hall of Famer, UFC yeah. champion, amazing guy. And so we meet and we start taking these tinctures from a company in Australia and right before the pandemic, I'm taking these, taking these mushroom tinctures, which are basically shiitake, cordyceps, lion's mane, reishi, and turkey tail. And these are long-standing uh, modes of health and wellness in Eastern medicine. In China, yeah. in Asia, you know, you pay your reishi doctor at the end of the year because you didn't get sick. You actually give them money at the end of the year because you were healthy all year. It's not the way we do it here where you have to pay in order to get more pills that actually make you sicker. So I got into this through Dell's, um, you know, him just being a visionary and, and wanting to get into this, this realm uh, of fungi. It's an entire kingdom that we've barely scratched the surface on, uh, along with, you know, starting our company, Umbo Mushrooms. Um, you can find us at Get Umbo. It's a great, great cause. We're in it for the cause, not necessarily to capitalize on this plant that's, uh, you know, the, the, not plants, this whole fungi queendom, queendom we call it. Um, it's more of a chance to just, again, hey, how are you feeling, humans? How are you feeling in life? How are you operating daily? How are you functioning? If you're not functioning well in your current status, you know, check out functional mushrooms. Check them out and see what they can do for you. They've been around since the beginning of time, and there's a lot of health benefits in, in them that, you know, that I think in time, in 10 years from now, we'll laugh at this interview because we'll have changed the way we approach our health and wellness and no longer will you approach your doctor. You will go approach an herbalist or a mycologist uh, with you know a, a background in what these mushrooms can do for you, because uh, they really have the ability, I think, to balance everything out to heal anything that we have wrong with us. Um, I, I've opened my mind up to that through also taking some journeys with plant medicines um, and, and psychedelics, and and actually opening up to the to the whole consciousness, to the universe, to understand that you know, God or whatever you believe in, put everything on this earth. There's something that can make you sick, but there's also something that can cure you from that, that ailment or that sickness. And, and if you believe in that balance and you live in that balance, um, I've, then these, these are something you should definitely check out. And, you know, the opportunity to farm them, <laughs> that's a whole nother story came about. Again, Dell, one of his friend's uncle bought a farm and it had a, a functioning mushroom grow on it. So me and my buddy Leo went out there and started learning how to grow mushrooms. And it's really a, a rewarding day to go out to the farm, to go into the, the fruiting rooms and, and, and sing to the mushrooms, talk to them, play my jaw harp for them or whatever, pick them, and then to go into the lab and do agar transfers and inoculations and really to, to give birth and give life to these amazing organisms that have such profound um, you know, compounds in them that are really bioavailable for the human body. And uh, I don't know where this is going, but I'm, I'm certainly excited to be on the forefront of it again to hopefully introduce it to people, um, try to get it into the NFL. Again, I'm having barriers there because when people think mushrooms, what they think about is psilocybin and psychedelics. Okay. And no, right. man, I don't want to trip out. Was this going to trip me out? I tell people, no, but you'll be tripping at how well you feel. You'll be tripping out at how good you feel, how, better, how much better you sleep, how, how much better you function during the day. Um, reishi mushroom is the mushroom of immortality and they call it that because it has a, a way of making everything just feel better in your body it's like your central nervous system gets a, a nice warm blanket on it and so these mushrooms once you dive into them and like get into that rabbit hole it's pretty amazing what they can provide for us so it's your web your company is getumbo.com is that what it is 
Yeah, there's two two companies that that one is getumbo.com. That's our we have bars, capsules, and soon tinctures that we're actually growing and extracting at mycolove.farm. So mycolove.farm is the farm website and getumbo.com is the the mushroom supplement site. Um, again, I'm in the I'm in the business world which, you know, I'm not really uh, a businessman and I say that or an entrepreneur but then people look at me and go well, yeah you are you're in the you're in the middle of it right now um, but what I really want people to do is just think think about your health and wellness approach it in a different way if they're for you you'll know if they're not hey at least you tried something I'm not here to, to say they're gonna solve all the world's problems but for me um, they've taken away most of my inflammation if not all of it I have I don't have any pain in my joints anymore um, they're mad they're amazing antioxidants um, they, they help in so many ways, like lion's mane is, uh, is high on the nerve growth factor. So our whole neuronal network that neurons make up everything in our bodies, if they're damaged or if they haven't developed, lion's mane will help them repair themselves or develop strongly. And so, you know, it's, it's really amazing once you get into it. And uh, again, <laughs> that's why everybody's kind of like, wow, what are you doing, Jake? Now, this is what I'm doing. It's super fun. It's not because I've been out looking and researching. It's just because I've been surrounding myself with good people uh, like Dale Jolly, good friends that look out for me and present me with opportunities to, uh, to make people think, make people like, yeah. think a little bit differently outside the box. Well, as someone who's a little older than you, I just, I'm Googling reishi mushrooms right now because I could use a little joint relief myself. So I, uh, <laughs> I, might, be, I might be swimming down those roads uh, with you as well. So what would, like, you, like you said, you're on a journey. And like your life is a journey, and I respect that. You're you're going where the road takes you. What would you now, as a 47 year old mushroom enthusiast, say to the 15 year old who thought he was going to win Super Bowls and do all that kind of stuff? What wisdom would you, at 47, impart to 15 year old Jake Plummer? I would say to that young man that be really mindful of how you speak about anything you dream about. Always put positive thoughts, positive words uh, towards whatever you're dreaming about. Um, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do what you feel you should do. Follow your dreams and uh, also pick up a book on mycology because the future is mushrooms. And if football doesn't work out, you know, I'll hire you at Michael Love Farms. <laughs> <laughs> Power to the shroom. Perfect. Well, listen, Jake, this has been great catching up with you, man. I enjoyed watching you play except for that playoff game where you took down my Dallas Cowboys. I'm over it. Yeah, it took yeah. me a while. I'm over it. <laughs> I'm over it, but uh, I always enjoyed watching yeah. you play, and I, I, I always find the post-career journeys fascinating, and it sounds like you've had a lot of fun and found a bunch of things that have just kept you motivated, which is the most important thing. Yeah, man. Thank you, Trey. It's been a pleasure being on, and you know, people out there listening, I mean, I, I do have my issues and problems and things I deal with daily. I mean, raising three kids, being married, you know, there's always something, but yeah. when you're in the right frame of mind, spiritually, mentally, physically... You know, you can you can uh, approach those with the right kind of compassion, the right kind of love to, to help yourself get through each day and realize that each day is a, a gift that we all should relish in and cherish. So thanks for uh, having me on today. It's been a lot of fun catching up and uh, appreciate the opportunity. You got it, brother. Thank you. Thanks again to Jake Plummer for sharing his story. And uh, he shared some of his product. And I can tell you, it worked. It was uh, it was good. I mean, medicinal is what I'm saying. You, you get that, right? So once again, thanks to Jake, and we wish him continued success. Coming up next week, we uh, we got a Hall of Famer, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you might know him by his name. You probably know him by his nickname, Megatron. Calvin Johnson joins us next week, and he's got some interesting things he's working on, too. We'll talk about that next week. Hope to see you then.